Ho ho, look at this loser, making a video about E3 over a month after the event was done and dusted. Do I receive my news by snail mail or something? In all seriousness, I did intend for this to be out a while ago. But life has a way of bending your plans over and taking them to Brown Town. My excuses are written up in the description for those who care. I'm only including this in this snippet so that I can hand wave it away and put it in my fair use disclaimer. Now, how about we get on with it? Every year since 2017, I go through this song and dance, where I tell myself I'll actually participate in the whole E3 hullabaloo. That for once, I'll sit through the raw presentations instead of just waiting for GCN to send the event. Sadly, he's looking to move away from everything wrong with videos in the near future, so this year especially I figured I'd commit to actually watching it. Then, just like with 2019's E3, work got in the way and I missed all the conferences. And since I don't have infinite time on my hands, I just watched the reveals on YouTube and kept an ear out for the finer details of press conferences released. So here's my shower thoughts on E3 and the Summer Games Fest. Odds are I got something wrong in my rambling, so if I did, verbally bitch slap me in the comments. I legitimately never expected this. I figured 2141 would have been a one and done type of game since most people were satisfied with modern and world war settings. Thank fuck they're giving this a shot, because the trailer is absolutely amazing. I'm not even a casual Battlefield player, and I'm pumped for this. Before I had the internet to play the games as they were intended, I suffered through the campaign of Battlefield 3, got three levels into 4's campaign, then I put it down for good. Eventually I played a few matches online in 4 once I got the PlayStation, and then I've sat out on each game since then. Hardline looked boring, one looked decent, but I never jumped in because that year my brothers decided the game we were pitching in to share on the Xbox was Infinite Warfare. Didn't help that the change in design from 4 to 1 was kinda eh to me, especially with the support class being neutered. And 5, well... I think we all remember the genius developer and Patrick Soderlund himself outright telling us uneducated people not to buy their SJWW2 game if we didn't accept the changes. Even after that whole shitstorm blowed over and we were left with just the game as intended, it looked kinda bland and played like a watered down Battlefield 1. It did have some cool features that I hope carry into 2042, mainly that suppressed weapons result in inaccurate damage indicators on the players you hit, or wait a minute, is it inaccurate or no damage indicators at all? I've obviously never played and I've heard conflicting stories. Regardless, that was a great feature that made suppressors more valuable, and I hope it returns in some form. 2042 thankfully looks like it's got the series groove back, and they're going for the same type of redemption arc that Capcom and the Devil May Cry series went through after the very controversial previous game. The combo of fan service and the badass remakes of Kickstart My Heart won me over immediately. But then they really sold me on this final bit with the wingsuit going through the tornado, giving me some Just Cause vibes. Zook man. <clears throat> after the gameplay reveal that came shortly after, the matter was settled and now I'm looking forward to a Battlefield game for the first time in, well, in all my life actually. Also, quick note to DICE, if these penguins in the trailer aren't part of the Arctic map, then you got no balls. However, I'd like to address the stupid fucking controversies this game has surrounding its decision to focus on what it does best. Because it seems like each Battlefield going forward has to have some retarded controversy leading up to it. Hardline had people bitching about having to play as cops and robbers instead of Americans against insert whatever murky country name you choose here. Battlefield 1 had bitches at rooster teeth. And other social media sites whining over there being no playable women in a World War 1 multiplayer shooter. As well as those making a big deal about a black guy on the cover art and in the first mission of the shit campaign. Battlefield 5, like I said, had the interesting decision to start the hype for their World War II shooter by having British female amputees channeling their Negan on some very tan-looking Nazis. 
And now 2042 has upset a small corner of the internet, most notably Dreamcast Guy, over the fact that it's going to remove the single player and focus on the part that everyone plays Battlefield games for. Never mind the fact that the last good campaign in Battlefield was an early 360 title, and never mind the fact that Five's campaign was incomplete at launch and boiled down to poorly designed stealth segments and the occasional firefight against vehicles. No, DICE should totally divide the workers in order to hobble together some story you'll forget as soon as the credits roll. After all, think of those epic moments from previous Battlefield campaigns, like when your tank gets the intelligence of a COD player and drives itself into an incoming rocket and gets stuck, so you gotta hold out till the terrors come to chop your head off. Those moments were just so fucking rad that it made the multiplayer look weak in comparison. Oh, and there's another controversy in the form of the next-gen console players getting the game for the marked-up price of $70, while both the Steam and Origin versions are only $60. This is one I'm somewhat torn on where I stand despite playing on PC. On one hand, I find it funny that people won't bat an eye at games like Ratchet & Clank or the Demon Souls remake being $70 single-player only games, with no news on whether new content will come to those games, yet they take issue with the new Battlefield being a multiplayer only game when the multiplayer is what Battlefield was famous for. On the other hand, and so far I've seen nobody acknowledging this fact aside from myself, the console players are being robbed since their $70 multiplayer game is actually an $80 game once you factor in the bullshit that is paid online. That's quite a steep price to pay, and I doubt many would argue that it isn't. Truth be told, I hope more people catch on to this, and this gets the ball rolling on a push to end paid online. Much like Battlefront 2 was the final straw to get everyone on board with wanting loot boxes out of their games, the fact that the PC audience get the game at a cheaper price and without having to pay an extra fee to play the game is something that should be true of all platforms, not just one. It's already bad enough that Microsoft tried to outright double the price of Live earlier in the year. I'd say that alone should have gotten this ball rolling, and I stand by saying this should be another Battlefront 2 type of storm, only directed at Microsoft and Sony instead of EA and DICE. But I know this is wasted breath on my end, since most people would either never boycott Xbox Live PlayStation Plus, or the few that do would get bored within a few hours and renew their subscription. So at most, people ignore the actual shitty side of this deal in order to spit the usual hue hue EA so greedy drivel. Which they are, don't get me wrong. But in this case, there's two companies even more greedy and anti-consumer than EA is as far as this game is concerned. And Microsoft and Sony aren't about to get rid of, or even make it an option to where you could play without paying. So really, the best I can say is to suggest my console viewers make the jump to PC. If not for Battlefield, then for whichever online game you're looking forward to in the near future. Because this shit is just getting ridiculous. And simply moving away to the platform that doesn't impose a subscription fee for core functions of the game is the absolute best we can do to see any type of change in this. Campaign-wise, I'm not impressed by the snippets shown, which has already killed about 90% of my interest in this game. I've never been too keen on Halo multiplayer. 3 and 4 have my best memories, and Reach I think is decent enough. And 5 I played maybe like 10 matches in total, and that's about it. So multiplayer in Halo has never been my go-to, mostly because before Reach, the campaign came first on the priority list from the developers. And while there have been leaks about how the Hunters have been drastically buffed, Again, and there's apparently a new type of grunt that will carry weapons for the AI to swap to in the middle of combat. All I'm seeing is words, not footage, so I'm still not impressed. Also, I controversially don't like the Banished, and we're once again getting a design of Cortana that does everything it can to cover up the holy bloobs. So rip. However, since the multiplayer is free to play in Infinite, I have literally nothing to lose but time. And while the gameplay is not at all Halo-esque, and it's still just a mesh of Crisis and Titanfall pilot abilities it was in the July demo last year. This does look like a nice experiment for Halo. I'm still not a fan of Halo with this form of sprint in the game, since it still disrupts the golden triangle that made Halo combat so snappy and engaging, all for the sake of balance. And honestly, I think balance is overrated as fucking Halo. This is the same series that's most famous for having a pistol that can drop people in just three shots. However, I think a version of Sprint in Halo could work. Allow me to present the Sprint in a little game called Immortal Redneck, 
It's a fine little indie shooter that I'd recommend just for the humor and the movement system. It's meant to imitate classic shooters like Doom and Duke Nukem, but with some modern amenities, like limiting your arsenal and copious amounts of RNG. But the reason I bring it up as an example for how Halo could do its sprint is because in Immortal Redneck, your weapon is constantly raised and you're still engaging with the enemies and the environments while being able to alter your movement speed at your leisure. In the enemies, they even adapt to your speed by having certain enemies fire projectiles not directly at you, but in the direction you're heading when you sprint forcing you to either make a snappy movement to deal with the enemy's projectile, or take the hit. You could easily take the ideas here and apply them to Halo's campaign, and even the multiplayer, albeit with a few more touches like increased bullet spread and bloom for the player sprinting while shooting, or tracking weapons tracking faster when they're tracking or sprinting player. I'm just spitballing ideas here. Maybe someday I'll do a video on ways Halo can move away from the dull, restrictive version of sprints used for the last 11 years, and either survive without it, or make its own spin on the mechanic. Also, this is purely my subjective view on the art style, but aside from Master Chief's Mark VI or Mark VII, whatever it is, and the Yaoroi armor, I believe? I'm calling it the Yaoi, though, because it looks gay. The rest look hideous. I was never a fan of the bulky designs and reach, and the blacks kind of absorb almost all the attention. I don't know, I'm just not a fan of it. And I'm especially not looking forward to seeing how my precious recon helmet will look. Reach did my baby the worst, though. Plus, this game is already starting off on the wrong foot. I mean, come the fuck on, 343. How can you make the same mistake Bungie made alongside you? What in the hell were you thinking? What in the hell went through your mind when you decided to make this the 14th year in a row that we get a new Halo game that doesn't have a version of... <laughs> On a final note to 343 Industries, if you're looking to increase the player counts in MCC and add in a smidge more content before Halo Infinite's lifecycle puts this game's new content on ice for a bit, then my only request is that the next update comes with split screen on the PC version. I recently did a campaign run with my younger brother and had a miserable fucking time. Half because he's a Fortnite loving little bitch who used the flight school to skip as much of Halo 3 as possible, but also half because we couldn't play together without swapping the keyboard and mouse back and forth. And I couldn't team kill his ass. Right, new trailer for Tales of Arise and uh, how it what? Been looking for you. All of you, get the hell out of my realm. This is Tannen's realm and it's ours, understand? Is it over? It's only just begun. I don't need it. I don't need it. I definitely don't need it. I 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 need it! I have literally never been more proud to have been completely wrong in most of what I've said on any given subject. My previous video discussing Arise, when we had all of, what, three or four trailers to go off of, was full of me controlling my excitement and keeping my expectations as low as possible, mostly because I didn't want to get too excited and set myself up for disappointment on release. But now, with the new trailer and the demo I've linked below, the game has far exceeded my expectations already. We got the two extra characters, each with badass designs and movesets, and Kisara's shapely ass. I knew waiting on making this video was a good idea. Also, what was the redhead's name again? I'm Dohilim Ilkaris. Mm, come again, please. I'm Dohilim Ilkaris. In their tongue, he's Dovakin. Dragonborn! We got the water exploration. We got gorgeous open fields to explore. A villain character with instant cool points earned for giving me Virgil vibes. This kick-ass battle theme that feels like a brilliant homage to Shout Your Soul from Berseria. Soundtrack. Wenn ihr da mal kurz reinhört in die normalen Battle Themes. Ah. 
Also, this badass beetle creature to fight, and even more footage of the comet that has me just salivating for more. When September rolls around and I get the game installed, you aren't going to hear a peep out of me for potentially months, and this game is responsible for that. I'm still not thrilled with Shion's Lila clone default look, and Kara believes she hears a similar if not outright the same voice actress for Lila in her, so at this point I'm just hoping that writing-wise she makes up for herself, because as of right now, Alphen's who I'm going to be maining and rooting for most on the journey. But even if Shion sucks as a character, she at least has some cool arts to pull off that keep her away from the same loser's table as Kor from Hearts. Okay, so the first Dying Light was one of my favorite open world games ever, flaws and all. I put way more hours into the demo version of the game than I ever did for Skyrim. That's how much fun it was. Never touched the following though. Looking back, the critics of the game, they only had two gripes they were right on, and that's the story and the lock picking. I heavily disagree with the claim that the stamina based combat in this game is poorly done, especially since it only incentivizes players to get crafty with the other mechanics of the game. Kinda like another recent game that critics couldn't stand. But you know what, I'm not going to get into ranting about shit critics of a game I liked. For now, at least. I of course agree that the story in Dying Light was dog water, but looking for a compelling plot in zombie media these days is like looking for a movie starring Kristen Stewart that doesn't suck as much balls as she did to get to B-list status. What held the game up for me was the atmosphere and the buttery smooth action, and it looks like the sequel is only going to give even more of that. I can't wait for all the game journos to make a big deal about the pole vaulting that gives them PTSD flashbacks to their atrocious Doom Eternal gameplay. Mmm, this bow animation sucks ass though. Looks like they're also heavily leaning into the story on this one, which, eh. I doubt all this talk about complex characters and faction wars will be present, at least to the degree they're trying to advertise it as. This isn't going to be deus ex with zombies now. But just as long as I can throw my electric baseball bat into one zombie's face, double up with three ninja stars to his face, and finish him off by drop kicking him like Godzilla into a sploder in order to send his head flying all the way to Belgium, I don't give a fuck how desperate the characters are to rebuild society. Can't wait to see how much of a disaster this one will be, since the last Marvel game published by Square was just so well done now, wasn't it? Although Eidos is involved, and as a huge fan of their open world games, I might keep an ear out just for this one. This is what I imagine is a lot of people's last chance they're given to Obsidian, since they haven't made a good game in 11 years. For me, I'm just confused because I thought Outer Worlds only saving grace was when Epic paid for it to be exclusive to them for a while, or maybe I'm confusing this for some other game? I don't know. Either way, there's not much to talk about since this is just the announcement trailer, and Starfield kinda stole the spotlight from this one. Arbitrary brownie points for the parody of the other game trailers though. Suddenly, and for no reason, people running. These pointless slow-motion shots make everything seem cool and should bolster pre-sale numbers. A new Metroid game that doesn't look like ass on an apple pie? Neat. Might buy it for a friend's Switch if we ever need something different to try. Mm. 
Hey y'all, watch me go from zero to original in like half a second. This game has a neat CG trailer. Just wish there was gameplay to give me an idea of what it is. I'm sure most of you interested in this game are tired of hearing that criticism. I know I am. But I also find it super interesting how people only now criticize this game in mass for having no gameplay footage at E3, yet still give a pass to major publishers when they have a pretty enough trailer to show. But Redfall would have held more weight if it had some gameplay to show off, but as it is, it's just bobbing and weaving out of my consciousness. And I doubt I'm alone on that one. So you're going to have an E3 segment dedicated to Doom Eternal almost two years after its initially planned launch date, and all you announce is a resolution upgrade on the new Xbox model? A hilarious joke, id. Also, less than a month later they announce actual content and changes come to the game, so why the fuck did they even bother? The new content looks fine and all, and especially the new master level, I've heard nothing but good things about it. However, I'm still hitting the snooze button on this game since there's no level editor. Even if all people make with it are bottomless pits of fire you got a meat hook over until you fight rooms full of just marauders and pain elementals, I'll still take that in a heartbeat. I love the art style and the lighting in this game, and the trailers have some creative looking designs. But I'll only ever watch a let's play of it because I'm seriously sick to death of the Souls-like formula. Code Vein, Dark Souls 3, and Fallen Order have all burnt me out on this subgenre of RPGs. So Elden Ring will never be on my computer beyond this trailer footage. And uh, yeah, that's all I've got as far as my thoughts on the games that interested me at E3 this year. Overall, pretty meh event, just like I expected. Battlefield and Tales thankfully saved it from being as bad as 2019's, so there's that at least. I didn't watch much of the Nintendo conference, and even before what little I did sit through, I wasn't going to bother with the Breath of the Wild sequels demo. I've never played any of the Zelda games before in my life, and I was not impressed when I had to clockwork orange myself just to stay awake through an old friend's playthrough of the last one. So this is as good as it gets with E3 for me. However, one perk of waiting so long to get to the recording this was that I'm doing it after the day this was dropped. This has had the internet on fire, and for good reason. It sounds like a really good idea. A bit of an evolution for gaming laptops, if you will. The skeptic in me has kept me off this hype train, though, since I have my doubts about the optimization, about the heat disposition, and especially about the durability of this thing, all for a modest price of only 500 bucks. Also, yes, I'm aware it has a name, but it's a name I refuse to use. Half because of my chum British Potato making a better name for it, the Gaben Go, but also half because Valve set themselves up for all the dick jokes that are going to come from the name and the shape of their logo. But hopefully I'm wrong and this thing turns out to be stellar. Just as long as this can run dying light at more than 30 frames a second, I'll be satisfied. I'm not going to say I'll get one right now, since it sold out within like 10 minutes of coming onto the webpage. But eventually I would be interested in checking out the steamy Switch, and possibly using that whenever I want to play games at a friend's place without lugging around my computer, my devices, and an oak slab. That'll be nice. But hey, maybe there is more for you to enjoy this E3, like the ESO expansion or Back for Blood. Sound off however you like if that's the case, and as long as it's not Smash DLC, I'll be happy to discuss it with you. If all else, I'll talk to y'all a little- wait, what the fuck?